Well, hello, hello, and welcome to another episode of The Webinar Talk Show. My name is Tom Singer. And I'm Liz Green. One of the reasons that Tom and I started this webinar talk show was to demonstrate how some great conversation can be a very engaging way to share important information. And I just this weekend found out that two people that we know very well have been laid off from their jobs. So there are a that's, lot of people out there. That's happening. That um, I kind of thought that we were through the layoffs uh, and we're opening back up again, but it seems like that is not the case. So there are a lot of people thinking about finding a new job or worried about losing the one that they have. So let's talk about that for a while. Yeah, I thought it was a good idea that we have a conversation about how does one even look for a job in the mm -hmm. world of COVID and work from home and, and how do companies go about looking for right. sort of those key hires. And so we have a very special guest today, a full disclosure. I have recently joined the executive search firm of Stanton Chase as uh, an executive search consultant, as a, as a director for them. And I'm really excited about that because it sort of takes together all of my skills that I've had over mm -hmm. the past 30 plus year career and, and focuses them on helping companies find those, those right people. So I thought today we would invite my new boss and my friend, <laughs> David Harrop. He is a managing director with Stanton Chase. He is also the regional vice president of all of North America for the firm mm -hmm. of Stanton Chase. So David Harrop, welcome to the webinar talk show. Woo! Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Liz. I'm very excited to be here this morning. So well, we're glad to have you. I think before we really get into this, this world of, of looking for a job and how companies find the right mm -hmm. people, could you sort of start off by telling everybody what is executive search and, and why in this world of like digital resumes and Indeed and all these different things, why do companies still do uh, utilize retained executive search firms? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, you know, companies come to retain search firms for a few reasons. Sometimes they're a fast growing emerging growth company and they don't have an in-house HR function to help mm -hmm. them walk through the process of how do you hire a new chief financial officer or a new VP of sales. Sometimes they, even large multinational companies, they'll come to us because they have such a, a unique and rare executive vacancy that they mm -hmm. need someone with rare set of skills and they need us to go out there and look for people who aren't looking and looking for that top tier talent that won't reply to a job posting. <laughs> and so they come to us to find executives who they couldn't find on their own. So tell me about, I, obviously I know because I went to work with you, but tell everybody a little bit about Stanton Chase. And then I want to find out a little bit about your career because you've spent your entire career since like fresh out of college, basically doing executive search. Yeah. So at this point, I don't think I can do anything else, but <laughs> Stanton Chase, we're one of the largest global search firms in the world. Um, 76 offices, 45 countries. We excel at serving even fast growth emerging companies globally and mm -hmm. companies that are even pre-revenue sometimes still have global needs. And that's usually where we come in and partner with them. Um, and you're right. I've done nothing but executive search my entire career. Came out of university, spent the first nine years with one other large global search firm and have been with Stanton Chase now 18 years. Uh, wow. It's it's been a really an amazing time, great colleagues um, that I consider my friends. You said something that I find really intriguing, that you go looking for the people who aren't looking. How do you find people who might be a good match who have no interest at the moment in finding a new job? Um, LinkedIn is the primary tool that my, friend, my, my research team uses. You know, when I first started in the business, there was no LinkedIn. There was, there was no internet, <laughs> come to think of it. And so we had to be creative and it was so much more complicated. Now people are more self-empowered to manage their careers. Mm -hmm. And they put their resumes up on LinkedIn for us to look at, which is very kind of them. And that's really the, the primary use of it. And mm -hmm. then 
people, they won't put that they're looking for new opportunities, but we're going to reach out to them anyway and present the opportunity. And that's one of the strengths of Stanton Chase and search firms overall is to get people who never thought about changing their job intrigued and interested mm -hmm. and then managing them through the process of the interviews, the negotiation for compensation, relocating their families. And, you know, we're, we pl provide a lot more than just here are nine resumes to our clients. <laughs> So, so David, as companies, you know, we've been in this sort of weird situation for the last now coming up on four months where mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the pandemic hit, everybody had to sort of work from home. What's been going on with companies who are looking to, to fill uh, key hires? I know that you recently worked on a search that started after the lockdown began and the entire search through the hiring process, through the person starting all took place with the team never meeting the candidate. So has that been common? What's sort of been going on? Well, there's kind of been two phases. The first six or eight weeks, no one knew what to do. Everything mm -hmm. just kind of froze because they didn't know, was this temporary? Is this going to be long lasting? So everyone just froze. And then probably about two months ago, people realized, look, businesses, they still have to operate. They still have to go on. They still need to make those critical hires at all levels in the organization. And maybe it's, it's weird and unusual to not sit across the table from someone before extending an offer, but yeah. they got over it. Mm -hmm. And here's the silver lining. Because it didn't incur the cost of the candidates flying into the city where the client resided, it became more inclusive, the interview process. There were maybe an, another round of Zoom interviews and more stakeholders within the organization got, got involved with the interviewing process. And I think that will, will last even when we're beyond the COVID-19 situation. That's interesting. I was on school board a ways back and we hired a new superintendent and a new principal sort of back to back, which was an interesting experience. <laughs> and one of the things that I thought was challenging is once you get to the point where you have flown people in or pulled them in and they have sort of invested their time and their energy and you have those interviews, you feel almost compelled to pick one of them, even if you're like, <laughs> you're, so do you, do you see maybe this, doing some of this more virtually, you get more options? Well, I think that you don't have that sense of commitment for that mm -hmm. final round. When you're right, you incur both the cost and time of the candidate flying in and the board or the search committee or... Right the hiring manager spending their time one-on-one -on -one with the candidate or candidates. Um, so yeah, I think that they, they do have the ability to say, okay, I, we thought these were the final three candidates, but we, we want to make a slight pivot and we're going to look for something else. I think they feel a little more freedom to make that change mm -hmm. where they didn't six months ago. Yeah. So if somebody is, uh, you know, currently in a position where they want to make a change, maybe they need to make a change, like Eliz's friend who, who got laid off. What mm -hmm. are some things people need to be doing right now in the world that we live in to position themselves so that they look attractive to companies? Mm -hmm. Some things are still the same. Update your LinkedIn profile. Make that as compelling. That's your marketing piece. That is your career marketing piece. Make that as compelling and vibrant as possible. No, no lies, but as, <laughs> as vibrant as possible. And update that once a week. Add postings. Put a, you know, you want an activity level to your LinkedIn profile. Does that oh, help? Oh, interesting. You? Yeah, does that help you get found by recruiters if you have more activity? Does that, does that matter at all? Well, I think it will keep you more top in mind within your network. Mm -hmm. okay. So the recruiters, we have a pretty robust, you know, LinkedIn recruiter search field. And we then can also put in, okay, here are the very specific criteria we want. And then we keep that ongoing. So anytime someone new comes up, 
that matches those criteria, we get flagged. So it's not so much to keep us on the mind of recruiters, but within your network, because realistically, you're going to find your next opportunity through your network, not through an external recruiter. So let's say I'm looking at, I've been laid off. Um, I'm going to need to look for something new. Are you saying that I need to be posting on LinkedIn things that are interesting to me and what I do? Absolutely. You know, use it as a platform to demonstrate your either, say, your domain expertise or mm -hmm. your functional expertise, or if you've learned a new coding language or a new skill set, mm. you know, those kinds of things, are, and those are the items you want to keep active on LinkedIn. Hmm. Oh, that's interesting. So once somebody sort of hits your radar, let's say that, that you're doing a search for, for a specific, you know, VP level candidate. And once somebody has, you know, come, come across your radar, what makes them stand out to you as a recruiter before you bring them to the company? Mm. Um, I look for their career arc. In other words, the, you know, how is, how's their career progressed? And what have they done besides keep their chair warm? <laughs> and then you kind of want to put that in the context of the organization they were in. You know, if, if they were, say, VP of sales and they grew sales 100%, but this is a fintech um, search and their competitors were growing at 200%, hmm. well, let's put it in the right context. So, you know, the, the criteria are very specific to the client needs and what we're looking for, but overall you want to see it a career progression moving forward. Now there could be some left turns along the way. Everyone has that in their career, mm -hmm. um, but it's more important of what have you learned from that? I mean, I joke with CEO searches with search committees that they don't, they want scar tissue on every candidate. <laughs> so you bring up an yeah. interesting point when people list the jobs that they have or have had on LinkedIn, how important is that paragraph that they put after? One of the things I've always taught mm. people is make sure you talk about what you learned in that past job and how you use that today. D does that resonate? Absolutely. What you learned, how you can transfer that learning experience to your current or future roles. And mm -hmm. that's critically important. And also what did you contribute? You know, a lot of times people mm -hmm. will just put a little blurb about the company. Right. And that's fine, but people are more interested, what did you actually do to contribute to that company's success? That's interesting. Does it make sense, even if I'm not looking for a job right now? It would, it seems to me it would make sense for me to do that. So if I actually grew sales by 100%, and that's a good thing, that on my LinkedIn profile, it should say in 2019, I grew sales by 100% because then it's there. I don't have to go back and do it. But I would imagine if my employer's paying attention, <laughs> maybe that's helpful. Um, I, so yes, now granted, I have a biased perspective because I want mm -hmm. every executive to keep a very current um, <laughs> LinkedIn profile. <laughs> yes. But I think in this day and age, no, no employer is going to be critical of the ex of executives having updated LinkedIn profile because he or she probably has an updated LinkedIn profile as well. Mm -hmm. Right. So we talked a little bit about what makes people positively stand out as you're looking <laughs> at potential candidates. What are some red flags that people have that make you say, nope, there's plenty of other fish in the sea. Um, gaps in their career you know, if, if there's a two-year gap, that mm -hmm. is a huge red flag. And I guarantee you that's going to be the first question I have. Because maybe they took a job and it didn't work out and they don't want to show mm. too many job changes. That isn't as bad as having a gap and then having to go back and explain it. Everyone so is, it is it better to place that job that didn't work out there? Or is it better to leave that gap and then explain it? I didn't quite follow. Sure, it's, you always wanna include the, that job and then you can just explain, look, the role, the company wasn't what I thought it would be. No one's gonna question that. 
But if there is a gap, then mm -hmm. it just is a red flag that needs to get answered. And it's never fully answered, to be honest. I mean, some <laughs> say, well, you know, I will go back and double my efforts in reference checking to explore someone's gap in their background. So let's right. say you have a gap in your background for some other reason, whether you were staying home with a child or you had some sort of health issue or that sort of thing. Would you suggest that we put something like that on LinkedIn or is that the, the we answer the question? I personally always feel more comfortable. So if someone puts, took a year sabbatical mm -hmm. or took nine months off and I need to recharge my batteries I, after that last startup, didn't make it. Mm -hmm. that makes sense. That's okay. I get it. Um, I, 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 so I always pr encourage people to be honest, forthright, and candid about it, and you can't go wrong. Well, and talk about what you learned yep. in that process. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. Because there's, there's lots of reasons why you might have a gap that actually could make you more attractive in some ways, correct? Right. And, and I, the most common gap I see, people say, I took time off to care for an ailing parent. Mm -hmm. That's totally understandable, respectable. No one's going to ever question that. So what are some other things, either positive or negative, that you run into with candidates? Um, again, it's the misrepresenting your experience, your qualifications, mm -hmm. or your accomplishments. That will always come out. Mm -hmm. You know, part of our search process includes very thorough and diligent reference checking. So we talk to mm -hmm. between six and 12 colleagues, former colleagues, um, other individuals you work with, maybe they were a vendor to you, what have you. And, and we try to provide our clients a very comprehensive picture of what this executive brings to the table, how they were successful in the past, and if you mis misrepresent any aspect of your background mm -hmm. as a search professional, if I'm doing my job right, I'm going to find that out. Because so that's, that's your job. Of, yeah, <laughs> that, that's, what, that's what you're here to do. Exactly. So is, is that then one of the reasons why companies prefer to work with a company like Stanton Chase is that level of vetting of candidates? I think that's just one of the reasons why. Mm -hmm. I think – we have a more holistic approach to working with our clients from helping them come to a consensus with the position description before we ever reach out to a potential candidate. We want to make sure the client and the client either being the hiring manager, the HR executive, or the search committee is in alignment with what they're looking for before we start the recruitment process. And through the recruitment process, we're managing the expectations of the candidates, the mm -hmm. client, keeping the, the process on track, and then straight through negotiating compensation, doing mm -hmm. academic verification, the reference checking. And then after they come on board, we're kind of that objective third party. If the client isn't happy about something, if the candidate thought something was misrepresented, we're the person they talk to and we kind of help smooth things over through the onboarding process as well. Hmm. Do you find yourself reminding the clients what they said they wanted as, I, as you go through the process? Absolutely. Because, you know, when they come up with what they want at the beginning, they're kind of working in a vacuum and, and mm -hmm. if you're not careful, they have this unrealistic wish list of, <laughs> of something that, you know, an executive that just doesn't exist. And so it's our job to help them become realistic, um, both what they want and what their compensation range is. Mm -hmm. And then we create um, something called a scorecard. So we distill the position description down to maybe four or five critical points. And then when the candidate, when the client starts to interview the candidates, they each work off of the same scorecard. So it helps bring mm -hmm. back to the forefront. These are the four or five most important issues we agreed upon at the beginning of the search. And let's look at the candidates and judge them on those same criteria. So that's exactly how we keep bringing it back to, this is what we said we wanted. 
Um, let's not lose sight of that. So David, I know over the past, you know, 20 years, one of the big things we've all read about in business is all about the fit of culture when you're looking for mm -hmm. a new job or you're looking for a new, a new client, you know, but one of the things in 2020, what we're learning about a lot of companies is maybe their culture is broken. So <laughs> what do you do when you're trying to, you know, help a company find a candidate and they're looking for that cultural fit or a person is looking for that cultural fit and maybe the cultural needs to be revisited. So one of the things that's happened in search and hiring over the last few years is the use of analytics and assessment tools. Mm -hmm. I mean, assessment tools have been around for about 50 years, but over the last four or five years, people started to pay much more attention to them. And then over the last two or three months, suddenly, you, you know, in time you raised such a great point, it's, it's okay, understanding what our culture is is one thing. But how about, how do we pivot and evolve our, our corporate culture to make it more sustainable and more appropriate for long-term success? Mm -hmm. And there are several strategic partners that Stanton Chase works with, and there's a lot of great tools out there that will help a company understand both what their current corporate culture is and what they the corporate culture they aspire to be, and how do you hire for that? Because mm -hmm. one of the great biases that still exists today is people tend to hire someone that looks like him or her on the other side of the table. Yes. yes. And now we're having some analytical tools to move beyond that. Well, we talked about that when we interviewed Gary Rifkin about really looking at what people's strengths are and you don't want an entire team that has the same skill set, right? <laughs> you want diversity within that team. So different people are better at different things. And it's also, you know, it's kind of both diversity and the companies change. You know, let's use mm -hmm. an example like Google. What kind of executive personality it took to be successful at Google 15 years ago is very di different than what it was five years ago. And huh. it's very different than what it's going to be five years from now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how do you bring on people and for where the company will be while still making sure that they're going to be successful current, you know, in real time, mm -hmm. Because even if people and they have the best intentions, they hire someone because this is where they think they want their cor corporate culture to be. Well, then they have to make sure this person onboard successfully and becomes part of that leadership team or part of the programming team or whatever that role is. You know, it's one thing to make that hire. It's another to make sure that they become truly part of the organization. Right. Awesome. That's really interesting. The the idea that what was essential to make you successful isn't necessarily the same skill set or personality or whatever you want to call it that will keep you successful right now or grow to the next level hmm. which makes sense but i think in a in a world where we at least our generation, we sort of stayed where we were planted and worked for a long time at a company. Are you seeing people sort of in a cycle now? They're, they're going to be at a company to five, five to seven years or whatever it is, get them to here, and then they're going to go find another company that needs what they do? Yeah, I do think there are, there's a certain exec, population of the executives out there who become not pigeonholed because it's self-driven, but they're going to be, you know, he or she will be a startup CFO. And right. they love getting in when the company's pre-revenue and taking it through the first 15, 20 million in revenue. And then once that function becomes a little more mature, they lose interest and they want to go back right. to that early stage company. So yeah, I do think there is certain populations or, or you know, a VP of sales, and maybe there's an sales executive who she loves kind of creating the sales function and building the 
compensation plans and and once it it kind of that structure is there they want to go back to another startup (laughs) or there are executives who are like look i don't want to do that startup i want a company that Mm -hmm. has some resources has the infrastructure and that's where their comfort level is so i do think and it's largely self-selection from the executives on what kind of companies they want to gravitate towards so david as we wrap this up what is your last little piece of advice for a company who's looking to make a strategic hire we talked a little bit about what the people need to do what are some things the company needs to do to look attractive um don't take for granted that people want to work for you You just (laughs) as you know make sure you have your value proposition in place if it's going to be you know career development if it's going to be a you know exciting technology or something that gives back to the community whatever it may may be really focus on your value proposition to the candidates knowing that it's going to be a two-way street awesome well david if somebody needs to know more about you or maybe their company is looking to fill somebody and and they know they're going to go down the path of talking to an executive search firm how do they find you how do they find stanton chase well, Tom, they can find you or they can find me on this, <laughs> this Stanton Chase website. And it's uh, just, you know, one word, stantonchase.com. Um, and we have, it's a pretty, I'm biased, it's a robust website with it lots is. of information about Tom's background and my background and our global capabilities. And you're based in Austin, correct? I have been for 20 years now. So if they were really trying to find you in particular, go to the Austin page to find you. Correct. Yeah. All my contact information is up there. Awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to working for you. I I found it to be uh, an amazing company. And so I'm excited about this next chapter in my journey. Uh, And again, thank you for joining us here on the webinar talk show. Thank you both for the opportunity. It was fun. This was a great conversation. And if you are looking to impart some information in an engaging way that people will take in and remember, Tom and I would love to have a conversation about how to reinvent what used to be an in-person event or just make your communication a little more fun. You can find us at webinartalkshow.com or on Facebook at Webinar Talk Show. We'll be back on Wednesday. Wednesday. I'm paying attention to the days this week. (laughs) Wednesday, our guest will be Crystal Washington, who is a technology expert who's going to talk about how to reach out and make those strategic connections in this weird virtual time in a way that doesn't feel weird. I'm excited about that conversation too. (laughs) I am too, and Crystal is awesome, so it's going to be fantastic. Thank you everybody for joining us. Remember what we always say, and that is a webinar doesn't have to last an hour, and it doesn't have to be a talking head over PowerPoint. You can get great information through in-depth conversations. Thanks for being here. Absolutely. Have a great day.